This episode of Engineering the Future is brought to you by The Personal, Osby's home and auto insurance partner. These past few months have shown us just how important it is to have someone in your corner. When it comes to home and auto insurance, The Personal can be that someone. If you would like to learn more about this exclusive program, visit thepersonal.com slash Osby. This podcast is brought to you by Osby, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, the advocacy body for professional engineers and the engineering community in Ontario. Welcome to Engineering the Future, a podcast presented by the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. I am your host, Jerome James. Tonight, I'm joined by Dan Lorison, professional engineer and manager of continuing professional development at APEGA, uh, the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists, Alberta. Welcome, Dan. Thank you for having me. So let's just jump right into it. When and why did APEGA implement mandatory continuing professional development? So our program was implemented in the late 1990s. Uh, they did some, they did a outreach to a, the groups of engineers and geoscientists to determine what the best approach was to building the continuing professional development program. Um, right. The goal of the overall program was to ensure licensed professionals were continuing their learning within their practice. And it's uh, essentially one of the main tools we have to prove our continued competency for licensed professionals. Interesting. Um, and how has it impacted the individual engineer? So we've not really conducted any formal studies on the impact. However, through general discussions with licensed professionals, they understand the value of the system and that it's not too onerous to complete. So the, the system was designed so that licensed professionals could take responsibility for maintaining the, their specific work records or their and their specific professional development records uh, and report summary hours annually to APEGA. So if our practice review board conducts a review, they request the specific CPD records from the individual. And these detailed records and summary entries are reviewed by a group of your peers to ensure that the intent of the continuing education has been attained. Um, as an example, we've had situations where experienced licensed professionals from other jurisdictions contact us at APEGA for uh, or the staff at APEGA and uh, request some support on their CPD reporting requirements in Alberta. The discussion usually lasts about 15 minutes as we sit down and go through and identify some CPD that, that most of them have been involved with. And uh, in the end, we generally hear, well, that was easier than what we thought it was going to be. Interesting. Um, so break it down for me. Exactly how does your um, professional designation work in Alberta? Are there only professional engineers and, and nothing else? Or can you be in two different categories of practicing and non-practicing? Are the professional development units different for both categories? How is it broken up? So we do have a practicing and a non-practicing element. So licensed professionals can declare themselves as non-practicing. Um, and those are identified within the PEGAS uh, registry, which is available on our website. The individual declares that they're not practicing the profession in accordance with the definition of the Engineering and Geosciences Professions Act or EGP Act. And uh, they are required to renew their non-practicing status annually. So. Uh, non-practicing members are exempt from the continuing professional development program. However, if they choose to return to practicing status, they will go through a resumption process where their application is reviewed by the practice review board. The board generally requests information on the methods used by the licensed professional to stay current with their technical skills within their area of practice. So it's really advised that completing CPD, even though you're in a non-practicing period, will be is beneficial because it will reduce the chances of practicing conditions being imposed on the licensed professionals return to practicing status. I also like to note that we have a special consideration application for those 
with short-term non-practicing status. So for an example, uh, leave for education or uh, illness, maternity slash paternity leave, or due to unemployment. Uh, these allow the individual to keep their practice keep their practicing status active with reduced CPD obligations. That is that's interesting that you still have to um, check in every year as a non practicing as well as practicing. It's within the R Act and general regulations. So when it was written, it was meant to ensure that people uh, maintained knowledge of their practicing status so that you wouldn't have someone who's non-practicing uh, end up falling into a situation where they they continue their practicing or they start re they restart their practicing without going through um, the resumption process so can you break down what actually is entailed within the cpd uh, requirements. Uh, what kind of areas um, are in, involved? What can count and what can't count for your professional development? So the the main area of the CPD program that we have is the um, professional practice hours. So if you're an active professional, you can claim up to 50 hours within that category. Uh, so that's generally the one where most of the people, the most people get. The other categories are formal activity, informal activity, uh, participation, presentations, and contributions to knowledge. Uh, what we found mostly is formal activity and informal activity are, are the ones that people fall into most, uh, most of the time. Now, with formal activity, it's all about formal training courses. So they're usually courses that are over four hours uh, and that have a test or have a testing component to them. So it can be under four hours with a testing component and it will, it'll, it'll, it'll meet the requirements. Otherwise, if it's only like a lunch and learn or something along those lines, informal activity is where those generally go. Uh, other informal activities are even just structured discussions. So between you and your peers, if you set up a discussion point that's off normal work hours, then you could uh, utilize it, utilize informal activity. Participation usually involves participation in, uh, you know, the formal committees and, and development type things for uh, like our our branches. And I, I must, I, my understanding is is uh, Ontario has branches as well in the membership side, if I'm correct. So those branches they do outreach, they do um, those type of programs. So those consider and participating in a PEGA related volunteering uh, events for, you know, young professionals or for students. Um, I, I had a, a quick question. Do you find that most engineers turn to PEGA to fulfill their requirements or is, are they finding other organizations that they're a part of um, other technical organizations um, uh, to fulfill their their PDUs, how, how are they filling, fulfilling their requirements? So when we've done our reviews on people's CPD programs, a lot of it is actually their community-based work, which was one of the elements I was going to discuss. It's the, okay. it, 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 they get involved in, uh, you know, science fairs for schools and those sorts of things that aren't necessarily formal OPEGA related projects. And those count because, it, you know, the, the positivity of engineers being out uh, in the public is is key uh, to promoting the profession, which we feel is is good for that. Um, you know, the ethical, the you know, we're there, we're there to support. Uh, so you build public trust by doing that. Um, I see. We do wish we had more a peg of volunteers for our committees and subcommittees and panels and work that we're doing. Um, but you know, a lot of them end up finding them on their own. We hope you're enjoying this episode so far. At OSPI, we're here for you, making sure government, media, and the public are listening to the voice of engineers. You can learn more at ospi.on.ca. Oh, it, it sounds like it's a great way to interact with your community and, and uh, push the awareness of engineering uh, further instead of just being siloed in, in your day-to-day 
uh, work and you can actually get out there and uh, interact with your community and learn something. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really beneficial for everyone and it. It really builds that trust. And that's the key thing that you need to have the public's trust. Are there different requirements for different disciplines or is it uh, the same across the board? It's the same across the board. And the re general requirements are 240 out pro professional development hours over a three year period. And you must report in three categories each year. So uh, it's up to the professional to decide what they're taking in the way of their courses that's beneficial for maintaining their competency. So it, it really relies on the professional to, to do that evaluation and determine what's appropriate for them. Do you have um, a, a back and forth relationship with the membership to bring new ideas and innovation uh, to the table for APEGA to say, hey, maybe we're looking for a, a webinar on this and um, a, a certain amount of people show interest in that um, to make it uh, be offered or uh, connecting them to a place that can offer such a, a webinar or micro uh, training session? So it, when it comes to referrals, we're not in the business of doing that because it could promote someone else and we want to remain fair and objective in it. Um, we do focus our, um, our uh, professional development offerings on our competency-based assessment program or the competency-based assessment that our registration department uh, in, uses to register individuals. So we try to use that as the stepping stone into the topics that we have. Um, the key component to that is, is that it's, it's a steady progression of that competency. And that's what our focus is. So we try and make sure that it's more global for all engineers, not just specific disciplines. Um, the branches actually get more involved in the more detailed and more technical related because they know the work that's going on in their areas and they know the engineers that are there. So they'll have a lot right. of talks and focus on those elements that's available to those individuals. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Um, I want to move uh, the conversation over to Ontario a bit here. Um, as you know, uh, Ontario's regulator, the PEO, has signaled that they're moving towards mandatory professional development. Um, what are some of the things that you would give as suggestions uh, before um, mandatory uh, CPD is put in place uh, to get us on the right track to making this a successful endeavor? I guess the, my feeling is, is that it's, Key challenge is ensuring your system links with the continuing professional development to the continued competency of the licensed professional, not just something separate. It has to be, it have that linkage to or linkage to that competency. So uh, the next point is critical, which is build a system that's not overly complicated for licensed professionals. Uh, this will reduce frustration during reporting periods. It will also reduce those. Uh, that give up and uh, fall into the non-conformance category. Um, don't forget the public's perception in the development and ensure there is right, transparency right. because it, a lot of people forget that we have that social license to, to be self-regulating. Exactly. Losing that is, is, is detrimental to the profession as a whole across Canada, not just in Ontario or just in Alberta. Um, so th those are some of the key things that I think you need to consider. And the last thing is we're currently upgrading our systems for reporting. Um, so building a solid online system to report for your engineers, have their ability to enter their activities through their cell phones is, is something that's important. You don't want them being tied to a computer, especially the new generations of engineers that are, are up and coming. Uh, one final question. Uh, as a professional engineer, why do you personally believe that mandatory professional development is a good thing and an important thing in our profession? So before becoming a staff member with the PEG, I was a rail safety engineer for a transit agency. As public safety is a key element of, of my 
former practice, uh, I'm a firm believer in a proactive approach. Mandatory CPD program is a key component to being proactive to, in preventing incidents from happening. As, as a whole, Absolutely. as a whole, mm -hmm. professionals don't want to trigger events uh, and, and cause a reactive approach, such as an investigation of an incident or things that result in disciplinary action. Preventing is always a better alternative. So, and in addition, as I said previously, there's an importance to being a self-regulating profession. We have a social license from the public and the CPD program is a component of that overall system that helps uh, maintain that social license. When the program is mandatory and transparent, it reassures the public that we are maintaining our skills. Well, it sounds like uh, Ontario is on the right path and uh, we're following in your footsteps <laughs> or soon to be uh, as a province. Thank you so much for being here today and breaking down the benefits of professional mandatory professional development within the engineering profession. Um, this has been a conversation with Dan Larison, prof professional engineer and manager of continuing professional development at APEGA, the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Alberta. From all of us at OSPI, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, thanks for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode.